Warning: Today's episode was recorded with a very bad cold. Any nasal sound or coughs or strange sounds that you may hear are part of the recording. You do not have to adjust your MP3 player. This is the Project Management Podcast. We bring project management topics to beginners and experts. Find us on the web at www.thepmpodcast.com or send your emails to pmpodcast at gmail.com. Hello and welcome to episode number 87. I am Cornelius Fichtner. This is the Project Management Podcast for the 9th of February 2008. Nice to have you with us. Would you like to know how to define the value of project management? Well, wouldn't we all? And today we even have an answer for you. Five episodes ago, we spoke with Mike Gropner about monkey management. I bet you remember him. We gave Mike another visit and we had a conversation about his current projects. We hear today about his involvement in IS governance, how he is dealing with SOX compliance. We follow him as he implements a $1 million computer just for testing. And he will also tell you how to define the value of project management. This week, we also have not just one, but two contests, and you can win four prizes of a total value of 800 US dollars. But you're going to have to act very, very quickly in order to participate. So keep on listening and learn how you can win. Today's project management podcast is sponsored by Genius Inside, an award-winning provider of collaborative project management software since 1996. Genius Inside solutions are easily and extraordinarily customizable and support all the key components of successful portfolio project management, from planning and tracking to detailed reporting and risk assessment. For more information, please visit GeniusInside.com and from the homepage, click on the Product Tour button to get a complete overview of this extremely comprehensive PPM solution. All right, now let's get right into our two contests this week. The first contest is a one-week only contest and you can win one of two copies of Mind Manager Pro 7 from Mindjet. Mind Manager Pro is a mind mapping tool. It allows you to create your mind maps on your computer and visually convey complex information in a very, very simple way. This is a neat tool and I have even heard that some people are using it to manage small projects, which is something that I'm very much interested in and I will actually be trying this out. We are giving away two Mind Manager licenses this week and each license is worth $350. There are two ways in which you can win. First, simply go ahead and send an email to pmpodcast at gmail.com and the subject line, of course, has to say Mind Manager. Your email has to reach us before midnight of Saturday, the 16th of February, 2008. Or the second way to participate is simple. Anyone who is currently a subscriber to our premium podcast will automatically be entered into this drawing. As you know, the project management podcast here is free, but some of you have chosen to subscribe to the premium podcast feed and support us with a small monthly payment. So to enter into the drawing, there is nothing that you have to do at all if you are one of these premium subscribers. And when we intro originally introduced our premium podcast feed, I told you then that we were going to have special bonuses for our subscribers and this automatically being entered into a drawing is one of them. Our second contest is the Leap 
year contest. On February 29th, we are going to give away two free licenses of the PrepCast. And you probably know by now that the PrepCast is our sister podcast where we help you pass the PMP exam. And again, there is not just one license, but two licenses that you can win. And again, each license goes to a different group of people. Of course, the first group of people, once again, is those among you who are subscribed to our premium feed. So everyone who's subscribed to the premium feed on on the 29th of February will automatically be able to win one of these two licenses. And the second license goes to those people who are registered users of our website. Uh, So all you have to do to win here is surf over to thepmpodcast.com, register a username, and you will be automatically entered into a drawing. And by the way, if you have a username, then you can also post comments on our episodes on the website. So those are our two contests. And don't forget to hurry with the first one uh, if you want to win one of those Mind Manager Pro 7 licenses because you only have until the 16th to either send us an email or become a subscriber to the premium feed. The two helpful resources that I want to point out to you today are in support of our conversation with Mike Gropner. One is about Sarbanes-Oxley and the other is about project management itself. First, we have the Sarbanes-Oxley Compliance Checklist. This checklist is by Richard C. Salcido. I'm sorry, I probably totally mis- mispronounced your name. And this uh, checklist will give you a list of 18 data points that you can look at in order to assess SOX compliance. Granted, this is a very high level checklist and it doesn't go all the way into the nitty gritty, but it is a good starting point for those among us who are just getting into Sarbanes-Oxley and need a place to start. The second helpful resource that we have is a about Mike's answer to the question of what's the value of project management. And you will hear this his, his thoughts during the conversation. However, the, the biggest problem that you will face is, you know, not answering the question itself because most of us have an answer about, you know, how what is the value of project management. But it's coming up with a convincing case for your company's executive. And that is why our second helpful resource is an article entitled Convincing Executives of the Value of Project Management. Again, a good starting point for those among us whose companies don't yet really have, you know, common project management processes. And you need to think about how do we how are we going to go about convincing people about the value of bringing somewhat more project management maturity to the corporate table here? All right, those were our two helpful resources. And now let's head right into our main topic, which is, of course, the project management conversation with Mike Gropner. Mike Gropner, PMP, is a project manager and noted presenter on project management subjects. He has presented project management topics to various PMI chapters as well as the SCCTC conference. In past lives, Mr. Gropner has held various project management positions in technology projects. These include commercial, military and space qualified systems, GPS systems, secure communications, database and data warehouse systems. He has served as a field engineer, project engineer, test engineer, systems engineer, project manager, and director of implementation services. Currently, he is employed at Prescription Solutions, which is a United Healthcare company, as a project manager in their PMO. He currently leads IS Governance, Sarbanes-Oxley, and Internal Audit Liaison and Infrastructure Upgrade Projects. 
Since 2003, he also serves as the PMIOC's PMP Preparation Committee Chairperson. In uh, this function, he has assisted hundreds of project managers each year in preparing and successfully obtaining their PMP certification. If you would like to contact him, please write to mike.gropner at marley.com. So, without further ado, here is the Project Management Conversation with Mike Gropner, PMP. Fellow project managers, we're back here with Mike Grotner to talk about what's going on in the life of project manager Why, Mike, so welcome back, Mike. Thank you. First question is always the same in these conversations about project management. It's a simple one. What projects are you currently working on? My current role is um, one of the things that I'm involved with is leading the IS governance, and that's dealing with the methodologies how are we going to govern in that? Um, a sub uh, process of that is SOX compliance um, and making sure that we can pass uh, Sarbanes Oxley's audits. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I also um, I've got a project where I'm installing a uh, million dollar computer that will be used for a test machine. Um, in Kansas. Now, the first one you mentioned, the IS governance, sounds a bit like a PMO. I'm part of the PMO, and I facilitate uh, the, the processes that are owned by our directors. And what I do is facilitate identifying process weaknesses, uh, remediation efforts, uh, process improvements. Um, uh, we meet once a week for an hour, and we talk about what the current things are, identify risks on uh, audit failures, uh, what audits are coming up, and what methodology improvements uh, mm -hmm. we need to do. Is ITIL in any way involved in that? Yes. It, it Interesting enough is we're moving towards ITIL. Uh, we also use COBIT. So mm -hmm. those are two of the you know, that are the emerging standards. And as a matter of fact, I've seen a presentation that brings uh, COBIT, ITIL, and uh, PMI's PMBOK as sort of the uh, foundation of an IT governance um, organization, a good governance orga organization. COBIT says, how do you, what processes are necessary? IT, ITIL is um, usually uh, related with the service management mm -hmm. aspect. And then uh, the the other big thing that connects both of them together is good project management practices. So it brings all three together for a good IS governance. It presents a strong uh, set of government's recommendations. And what it really does is, is there's so many opinions out there is that now you have sort of a baseline where you can go and say, okay, Instead of arguing about what is the best way to do things, is let's get involved in implementing a good way of doing all of the, all of the things that we need to do. How long do you think something like that would take to implement? It sounds like an enormously large project. I've started in project management in 1982, <laughs> and based on the current earned value, I think uh, 3,050, 3,000, 4,000, uh, you know, somewhere in that range. <laughs> The second item that you mentioned on your list was Sarbanes-Oxley. How are you involved in SOX? I am the primary focal point uh, for the auditors. And uh, my role is to make sure that the auditors get the information they need, uh, make sure that they stay within scope, and make sure that we respond in a timely manner. So... So it's sort of like I'm I'm the uh, the guy that everybody hates because um, I'm working on making sure that we stay in compliance uh, within the organization, and the auditors hate me because I say, "Why are you asking that question? Are you in scope? Do you really understand what you're talking about?" and stuff like that. So it's it's a rather interesting and challenging thing. Uh, is to get everybody on board and pass SOX audits. You're pretty much between a rock and a hard place. 
Yeah, but um, as I said before, you know, the harder the project, the more fun it is. Yeah. So how do you manage it internally? Do you look at what the Sarbanes-Oxley auditors will be asking in the future and then you turn around and say, hey, internal people, this is what we're going to be measured by, so let's make sure we're covered? No, no, I just, I, I'm just incredibly charming. <laughs> <laughs> no, a- actually, um, in Sarbanes-Oxley, it's about – actually, if you look at the Sarbanes-Oxley, it's, it's a very short law. It's about 180 words. And to summarize it, it says you must have a process, you must follow the process, and the process must be effective. So the nice thing about SOX, where some of the other audits uh, don't have the rules, is you start with corporate risks. You identify corporate risks. And then you develop, uh, and this is not a project manager, but this is the, the company develops controls on the risks. Those controls then are driven for processes. And, and then, then the processes are actually what are audited. Uh, the process generates evidence, and the evidence is expected for compliance. So all I have to do is demonstrate that we have a process, we follow the process, and it's effective. So let me ask you a question. If you had a project where all the documentations uh, that you submit to the auditor has the same file date of yesterday. <laughs> okay. I see where you're getting at. Well, do you have a process? I have a process to finish right. my documentation the day before the auditors show up. Yes. Well, no, you have a process. You follow the pro- you know, do you follow the process? Yes, you do follow the process because you created all the documents. But the last one is the kicker. Is it effective? Obviously not. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. So, I see. I see. All right. And and the third one that you mentioned was a 1 million dollar computer? Yeah, it's an IBM i5 series. It's actually a mid-range uh computer and it's it's actually the mid-range of the mid-range. So, that computer model you could probably get for under a half million to um, probably over sixteen million. Uh, it's a multiprocessor. It's the um, what it used to be called was the AS four hundred, and now it's yes. the i five series. Right. Are you allowed to talk at all what's going to be uh, computed on that machine? You said it was going to be used in Kansas City as a test machine? Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually um, what we do uh, the, at the company I'm with is we do pharmacy benefit management. Um, and what that is is when you go to the, uh, the, the counter of a, uh, to get your prescription in the U.S., they enter your information in the computer, and it will be transmitted to your – PBM or pharmacy benefit manager, and typically within a half a second, your claim is adjudicated and approved and re- returned to the pharmacy, and then you get your drugs. So um, currently, uh, we are um, adjudicating, I think this year we'll adjudicate about 675 million claims. Wow. And so what we're testing is that claims adjudication process. And um, uh, setting up a, a much more robust test system. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Are you facing any particular challenges on any of those three, the IS Governance, the SOX, the $1 million computer, that just pop out and say, hey, I want to talk about this one? Um, you know what? It's all about communication and management. I okay. mean, each pro- you know, if, if each project didn't have its, its issues, um, I wouldn't be needed. Mm-hmm. So the idea is, you know, when I when I approach this, um, uh, let me tell you an interesting story. Is is I was asked two years ago about how do we define the value of project management, and it took me two years, and I finally found out the answer. Okay, listen up, everyone. This is interesting. <laughs> There is no value in project management. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, you just made about 10,000 listeners very angry. <laughs> you got to explain that. But think about it is, oh, you should hire me and pay me six digits because I can create a Microsoft schedule. No. Yeah, okay. Okay. So where, where, where does our value lie? Does it really va- lie in managing the projects? And I'd say no because if you go through the PMBOK, Mostly, you know, all of that stuff is sort of, well, you, you create a collection of, of knowledge and then you execute it. So what, where is our value? Why, why do we get paid? And our value is really in risk management. 
the identification of risks, the communications, the uh, management of risks, the controlling of risks, and executing it. So in other words, if, you're, if you think your job is delivering the schedule, the MVP uh, file, then you really haven't established your value. If you view that your job is to communicate the risks and how you're going to manage the risks to, the ma to management, then you're hugely valued. And if you do that without a schedule, what difference does it make? You know? So, so my point of view is that the value in project management is really the risk management mm -hmm. piece, the, the accepting ownership of the problem and then managing it. So if my job, as you say, is mostly risk management, how do you manage these risks then? Well, there's, there's two ways I, I do that. And, and I describe I have two modes. I have a mode of super project manager. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in that mode, um, I would have a project plan that probably would be three to 10,000 tasks and managing and doing it, you know, by the book. Right. But what I'm finding is there's a lot of, of, of companies out there that like the idea of project management but don't really have the fundamentals behind it. So in that organization, you really have to be like a junkyard dog, is you have to be somebody who goes out and makes the culture change in a way that they find acceptable. So in other words, if you go out and you just start biting people, you're probably going to be very <laughs> ineffective. But if you go out, and, and I just had a, a situation where we have a vendor that was non-responsive. And this was a problem that we were trying to solve at a very strategic level. So I was given the task of engaging them in the project. We started on trying to get them on a, uh, uh, a time and material contract to get engaged on uh, July 2nd. We actually got them engaged in uh, October. So one would say that I was a pretty much a failure, right? But, but I was actually a success because every week I would send an email. Every week I was saying, we need to get this done. What do you need? What do you need? And, and we'd get responses or we wouldn't get responses. But I was the junkyard dog is I was going through the process and building up a set of documentation. So at the, the final meeting where there was a come to Jesus meeting is, the directors had all of the information, and it was like, what? We've had 20 emails, 15 that you haven't responded to, 10 that you just said, well, I don't understand your 15-page your scope of work, but I don't have any questions for you. Um, you, underst you, you understand what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. so I used the process to build a case. Right. You know, And that's where I, I talk about being a junkyard dog is – is in those organizations that are less mature is to get the project done without and, and still maintain the process and stuff like that. What tools do you use in regards to risk management itself? Uh, you know, uh, the risk management is really more about communications mm -hmm. than uh, we do have risk registers and that. But typically, um, the, the, the deliverable that I, I see is, is management adequately informed of the risks? Um, and, and are they only involved in the risks that they need to be? So in other words, um, my job is never to talk to the CIO. Okay, because if I'm talking to the CIO, I have, I have an issue that I can't solve. And let, let me give you uh, the, the SOC status report. Occasionally, I will get in the elevator with um, the CIO. He'll turn to me and says, Mike, are you keeping me out of jail? And I'll say, this week I am. <laughs> and ultimately, that's risk management. Do I have a risk that I need to know about? No, I don't believe so. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice day. So, so I, I, you know, I use Microsoft Project. I teach advanced Microsoft Project courses. 
It's a wonderful tool. It's a miserable tool, you know. But the tool is not the project management. That's the real. The real thing is: Are you connecting with people? Are you communicating with people? Do people understand what the vision is, and where do we go from here? Do you work in a functional matrix or projectized organization? We work in a functional, or I'm sorry, a matrix. Matrix organization. And okay. and I work in the PMO where the PMO works on projects over a hundred thousand dollars. What would you say are the strong areas on of your PMO? Where are you really good? I am working with. Um, there are. 20 people in the PMO, and all of them are awesome. I walk into work, and I have a hard time to say, you know, I, I know at least five or more project managers that are clearly, um, in my opinion, as good or better than I am. And I think all of us walk in and, and just look around and say, you know, we've got a phenomenal team. And that's really my boss's um, uh uh, responsibility is to build this uh, phenomenal team. And where are you sort of in need of help? I don't think we're we're uh, unusual in the sense of maturity. Mm-hmm. In that um, we're currently um, trying to do a better job of understanding resources and how much resources in relationship to projects and operations. If there was one thing that you could change in your PMO, what would you change Free donuts? I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the point is that that the PMO is an evolving process. And, and first of all, I haven't been able to find a really good definition of a PMO. I, I classify it as in one of them is strategic management of projects. In other words, project prioritization. Uh, one is in uh, another function is creating the processes and maintaining the processes. And then the other is just the body shop of, of uh, the PMO. Mm-hmm. I think um, if I would change anything, I would change uh, project management to report directly to the president. Really? The concept here comes from aerospace, where QA is only allowed to report to the president. And the idea being is if you are going to get the truth, they can't serve anybody but the president. So I see that um, long term that eventually the PMO will be reporting directly to president, much like marketing. Mm-hmm. You know, marketing reports directly to the president and achieves the marketing task. Well, we have operations and then we have projects. So once we get to a point where we stop looking at IT projects and we look at corporate projects involving the business and the IT I think that that is where there will be some significant changes. Well, I, I can see where you're going with this because very often it is said that project management is a way to transform your business. So your upper level management has sort of a three-year, five-year vision with goals and where they want to go and Who's going to implement that? Well, we project managers are. We're going to take these goals. We're going to roll them down into into objectives and make projects out of it. And we're going to turn the business around the way the upper management wants it. So it makes sense that we should report directly to them and not to the CIO. Right, instance. because the CIO then sets the agenda. Not not necessarily bad, but, yeah. but, he, but he sets the agenda. So... Um, the other thing is is that the realization that project managers are not asked to participate in the strategic process. We are doers, not planners, or you know, not not thinkers and designers. Mm-hmm. We're given a project, and we should either accomplish the project if it makes sense, or identify that it doesn't make sense and close the project down. All right, total change of subject. Mm-hmm. One thing that I always wanted to ask you is this. You've been managing the PMP workshops for the Project Management Institute of Orange County for the last four years or so. Um, why? Why are you doing it? What do you get out of it? Well, the the w- reason why I originally did it is I took the course and I was unhappy with the course. Yes, I heard that story. Yes. yes that's right. And uh, uh, at the time, uh, a, a lady by the name of Chrissy Monson was in charge of the um, professional development. And she said, well, you know, you've got a lot of great ideas. Why don't you take it over? So she gave you a monkey. She gave me a monkey. (laughs) 
since then, um, I do it for a number of reasons. One is, is if I was 34 years old, um, there's a lot of job opportunities. But as you get to be a more senior project manager, the opportunities become less from a resume point of view. And they're much more available as a networking point of view. So I use it as a, a, a facility to network and get people to know who I am and my capabilities. How many people do you have in your network? Depends on uh, how you define it, but uh, we have a hundred and over 150 uh, PMPs that we'll teach. In general, I would say my network is about 3,000 people right now. Nice. Very well, nice. we live in a, a Southern California where they have 14 million people. So Right. Yeah. Any new projects on the horizon for you at the moment? I don't think so. At this point, um, I have to finish up the ones I got. <laughs> my plate's full. All right, then. Let's take a look into the short, the, 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 the short distance here, the short time frame. What's on your plate next week? What are you going to take care of? Uh, next week, um, we have some... Um, some process issues that we need to take care of. And uh, that vendor that I told you about, we're finally in, engaging with it, and so we need to get them started. So that's what's uh, – that. those are my uh, urgent and important monkeys for next week. <laughs> All right. Final question for you. I think if I remember right in our earlier interview, when we talked about monkey management, you mentioned that you do not do meeting minutes. How's that working out for you? Are you still being looked at funny and uh, are things going well? Uh, that will show up on my review. Um, but again, I, I don't find them valuable. People that have found them valuable says, oh yeah, well, I can I can tell you, you know, well, what was said and who, who, who was to blame. In my view, is the project manager was always to blame. So blame me and let's move on. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time again today. Appreciate it. It was a pleasure. And that was our interview with Mike Gropner, PMP. That's it for today. Thank you very much for listening. Once again, let me remind you that you are going to have to act quickly if you want to win one of these free licenses for Mind Manager Pro 7. Either write an email or subscribe to our premium podcast feed before Saturday, the 16th of February, 2008. As always, you can find us on the web at thepmpodcast.com. And if you are a project manager who wants to become PMP certified, you can visit pmprepcast.com. In this podcast, we teach you concepts, tools and techniques that you need to know in order to pass the PMP exam. Please send your emails to pmpodcast at gmail.com. And when you write, please tell me where in the world you are writing from. And finally, we have this. If there were no problems, there'd be no need for people like us who solve them. Until next time. <laughs>